the great debate. Do you have SIBO or do you have candida? Or might you have both? How do you tell the difference? That is the topic of today's video. So if you want to know, stay tuned. I'll start off by saying that it can be genuinely tricky to tell these two things apart. That's why you're here. That's why you clicked on this video, right? And what makes it 10 times worse is that the testing for SIBO and the testing for candida suck equally badly. So we can't even rely on the testing that's available to try to diagnose these conditions. Rather, we're going to go about this looking at symptom presentation and medical history to put two and two together and determine which one of these is most likely based off of what we know about you and your body and your experience. So right out the gate, let's talk about one that's like the classic beyond classic, the trigger of antibiotics. Obviously, this is, this is the thing with candida, right? So you're marching through life, do it a-okay, and then you take antibiotics for a UTI or strep throat or Lyme disease or a skin rash, whatever it might be, and whammo, you start getting candida symptoms or maybe vaginal candidiasis or oral thrush. So this is very well established in the medical literature. We know that this happens. A lot of people have this experience. However, I'm going to pause here and say this doesn't explicitly rule in candida and rule out SIBO because I have heard many people with a trigger for so-called SIBO that is antibiotics. My podcast co-host, Amy Hollenkamp, RD, has this exact story. If you go back to episode one of our podcast, the IBS Freedom Podcast, she says that she had very mild GI upset until she took Cipro. And then that's when the bloating and the IBS and the, the later diagnosed SIBO really reared its ugly head. And I think that this is in, largely in part because there's research coming out slowly but surely that indicates that the overgrowth, the increased quantity of bacteria here is not the real problem. We've been chasing the wrong goose. Rather, it seems that the problem for these people who are diagnosed with SIBO is dysbiosis of the small bowel, which can absolutely be triggered by antibiotics and poor motility, poor ability to brush the debris and the bacteria and the food out of your small bowel and into the colon where it belongs. Those seem to be the two true root causes of what is oftentimes labeled as SIBO. So antibiotics doesn't rule out SIBO in this case, one point for each. Ugh. All right, on to something else, maybe something a bit more concrete. How about the symptom of bloating, right? Like bloating or the diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, that happens all the time with SIBO, right? You get the initial diagnosis of IBS and then you find out later it's SIBO. Oh, but wait, that happens with candida all the time too. Before SIBO came along and was everybody's favorite poster child, the version of that that used to kick around in like the 90s and early 2000s was that everybody was getting diagnosed with dang candida left and right. So oftentimes people with IBS, or I'm sorry, oftentimes people with IBS or bloating can have either SIBO or candida or both. So likewise, we are off to a rip-roaring start with this video, and we do not have any additional information yet. <laughs> Son of a gun. All right, moving on though, because I think the next one will be helpful. Sugar. What happens to your symptoms when you eat sugar? This is actually a pretty clear way to distinguish these two conditions. So on the one hand, if you eat sugar and you feed the candida, virtually 100% of the time, you're gonna feel a bit worse, if not tremendously worse. And this is why one of the tenets of an anti-candida diet is that you need to eliminate or drastically, drastically reduce sugar. So consuming sugar is going to increase the symptoms of candida overgrowth pretty much across the board. Versus if somebody with SIBO eats table sugar, they usually feel pretty okay in that moment. Now keep in mind, high blood sugar for a sustained period of time or diabetes can wreck your motility and then that can cause SIBO. But I'm talking about like, if you ate simple sugar right now, how would you feel 20 minutes from now or 60 minutes from now or three hours from now? These people are going to feel fine. No significant change in their symptoms. They're gonna be a-okay. I mean, heck, if you just look at the Cedar sinai SIBO diet, the low fermentation diet, 
their exact recommendation is to eat simple sugar and simple carbs and refrain from complex carbs because the more complex the carbohydrates or the more fermentable they are like FODMAPs, the more so it's gonna trigger symptoms for these people and supposedly feed the SIBO versus simple sugar, which does not. But simple sugar sure as heck feeds this guy. So your reaction to sugar can tell you an awful lot. Now, another one that I'm gonna point out, this goes to the kind of medical history piece of it, is root causes. So you can look and you can think about what are some of the root causes of SIBO and does it make sense that I would have SIBO versus candida? For candida overgrowth, the honest to goodness root cause almost always is one of two things. Oftentimes it's antibiotics, man that's sloppy, or, and I'm just gonna go, I'm, I'm just gonna put this here, or something that suppresses your immune system. So this would be things like corticosteroids or immunosuppressants or maybe chemotherapy. Something that directly tinkers with or suppresses your immune system can absolutely cause candida, but by far the most common cause of candida overgrowth is going to be antibiotics. Outside of those two things, there's not a lot that's gonna cause candida overgrowth for most people. On the other hand, over here in SIBO land, to the best of my knowledge, I don't know if immunosuppressives are going to cause SIBO as frequently as they would cause candida, but you know what will? Anything that messes with your motility or anything that could potentially decrease stomach acid. So you can start thinking about root causes over here for SIBO. Think about things like PPI use or antacid use even. Think about things like uh, opioids. I'll just abbreviate it as OP. Think about things like um, if you take a medication that causes constipation or if something really stressful happens and that causes constipation. Start thinking about things like hypothyroidism right? Things that disrupt your motility. So again, the two root causes usually for SIBO, something that messes with motility or something that messes with your stomach acid versus again, something that suppresses your immune system or directly kills the microbes in your gut. I honestly think that the last bit, the root cause is going to be what points you in the right direction 98% of the time. And then if you really need to confirm or deny these findings, go ahead and eat a big old cookie and see what happens. Now, here's the thing, my lovelies. If you don't want to go it alone, if you're like, okay, cool, but I'm still confused or great. Now I know which one it is, but I still don't know how on earth to treat the darn thing. I've got good news for you. FODMAP Freedom is here, almost very, very close. <laughs> So for those of you who have joined the waitlist, which just means you gave me your email and said, I want to know when it's open, count me in. I want more information for people on the waitlist. You're going to get the first email announcement on August 14th. That's Monday, August 14th. That's only about a week and a half away people. Then you have a whole week to doodle on it. Think about it. Talk to your significant other, figure it out, do a discovery call with our FODMAP freedom coach and really figure out if it's the right thing for you. That's why you get first dibs and you get a special enrollment gift when you do in that first week. Then if for whatever reason you don't want to join the wait list, I don't know if you have like trust issues and you don't want to give me your email, it's fine, whatever. Then you can wait until the following week, the week of the 21st of August. That's when I'm going to be posting it live on YouTube and Instagram and emailing it out to everybody else. And then if there's still seats left, you can register at that point. But either way, FODMAP Freedom Enrollment is super close and I'm so excited to share it with you all. I actually have been re-recording the entire program, revamping it, adding a ton of new information and it's gonna be so juicy. It is so good. I mean, it was good before, but it's spectacular now. And I'm so excited to roll it out for this August 2023 class. If you're watching this video after tw August 2023, no worries. You can still join the waitlist and join for the next group. But if you're seeing this now, when this video is published live, I don't know, get on the wait list, check it out. It's no obligation, just check it out, see if it floats your boat. And I would love to see you there and help you out in the Q and A's and ultimately help you figure it out. How are you gonna go about treating SIBO, Candida or both? Let's get you feeling better.
Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.